Gresham College presents Gresham's Law and Economics, Background to the Crisis by Professor Victoria Chick. Well, I, I hinged the talk on so-called Gresham's Law because of where I am, and I'm enormously pleased to be in this distinguished place. Um, but the analogue that I'm going to try to um, draw is with economics, where I argue that bad theory has driven out good theory. Uh, I don't know whether theories have a price, uh, much less if they exchange at the same price, um, but I think we can leave that aside. It's just a rhetorical device, after all. Um, if bad theory has driven out good economic theory, you might think, well, so what? I mean, economics is just an ivory tower discipline, and it's too bad for the people who do it, but that's as far as it goes. That is not the case. Economics can influence the future of its own subject of study, and has done. This is very obvious in the case of the present crisis. The fingerprints of bad economic theory are all over the policies that helped to create the present crisis, and unfortunately, they're shaping the policies employed to deal with it as well. So everyone here is affected by this state of affairs. We are all paying the price of the success of bad economics, and you deserve to know something about it and how it has come to be so dominant within the economics profession and influential outside it. Most of you will know this picture. I'm sorry, it's the only picture I have. It's a bit much, isn't it, really? The only picture is a four-year-old picture of the Queen, which everybody has seen. Um, but it was an important moment um, when she went to open a new building at the London School of Economics and asked when she was being treated to uh, an exposition uh, of the causes of the credit crunch, as the banking crisis is sometimes called, why did nobody see it coming? And um, Professor Gary Carno, who is pictured there, um, was reported as saying, at every stage, someone was relying on somebody else, and everyone thought um, that they were doing the right thing. I assume he was talking about the herd behavior of the market participants. Um, <clears throat> but the great majority of economists didn't see it either. Willem Bouter um, cut to the heart of the matter in this statement. Mainstream macroeconomic theories not only did not allow questions about insolvency and liquidity, the factors at the heart of the banking crisis, to be answered, they did not allow such questions to be asked. There was no place in these theories for illiquidity and insolvency. They couldn't happen, but they did happen. Another answer to the Queen's question is even worse, for it exposes something unpalatable at the heart of economics. One economist remarked that the banking crisis was the best predicted crisis in history. It was predicted by many, but the warnings were not heard, uh, either by mainstream economists, for, such, for whom such outcomes couldn't happen, or by policymakers and regulators whose thinking had been guided by this kind of economics. The warnings did not fit the shared belief system of those people. Those who predicted the crisis were outside the club. To the mainstream, they were nobodies, and nobody saw it coming. <clears throat> Some did see it coming, so there must be some good theory out there. Um, it is time now, I think, to address uh, what I mean by good and bad economic theory, and then I shall explore how bad theory has managed to drive out good. <clears throat> 
It should be easy to agree that a theory that has no room for illiquidity or bankruptcy is a bad guide to the crisis of 2007-8. Where does this theory come from? It arises from a foundational element of mainstream economics called rational choice theory. The idea is that everyone has a set of preferences for a variety of economic goods and maximizes their acquisition of them subject to a budget constraint. To get what they want, they may sell some of the goods that they have. So we have supply and demand. Enter another key assumption, and that is that markets always clear. Supply always equals demand. From this, it is concluded that markets and prices reflect all relevant information. When applied to something that is wanted only for its monetary return, such as financial assets, uh, you have to allow for the fact that the future price of the asset may vary. This constitutes a risk of capital losses. Um, this risk is modeled as a probability distribution, a bell curve, based on the past behavior of its price. Then once again, the market is assumed to do its work. Risk is appropriately priced, according to this theory. The fact that the observations taken um, from the past don't include a cataclysmic event like the one that we saw in 2000 and 2007 and 8 um, has a lot to do with why it was viewed as a set of impossible events. But this result, um, that risk is appropriately priced, is further generalized in what is called the efficient markets hypothesis. <laughs> um, efficient markets hypothesis, which says that markets take full account of all publicly available information, informing prices, and are therefore efficient in allocating capital to the best uses. One branch of mainstream theory allows for what is called asymmetric information, that's you knowing something that I don't, in simple language, uh, and the possibility that markets do not clear. But the perfect market remains the benchmark. Departures from it are called imperfections, rigidities, or market failures. This is why this group is still counted as part of the mainstream. If the efficient markets hypothesis is true and everybody believes it and acts on it, then all assets are equally liquid. The value the market places on any security um, is the correct price, and any asset can be sold immediately at that price. All assets are equally liquid. Okay? This is already quite enough nonsense, but there is more. The theory of rational choice has been further generalized into a theory of complete markets. It is proposed that there are markets spanning all possible future contingencies and outcomes in which agents maximize their acquisition of their preferred economic goods and assets subject to the constraint of income and their ability to borrow at all future dates. Since the budget constraints are assumed to be honored and future contingent demands are known, bankruptcy is impossible. It is a perfect world. It is also a world which would exhaust human computational power and the resources to run such markets, but it is, this is one of the central ideas of mainstream theory nonetheless. <clears throat> the trouble is, economists believe the results of their theory and they advise policymakers. This perfect world has influenced policy through which actual institutions have been refashioned more closely to resemble the perfect markets of theory. If markets are efficient, liquidity is no longer an issue, so let us relieve the banks of the burden of carrying low-yielding liquid assets. Liquid asset ratios required of UK banks were reduced successively from 1971 onwards and in 1998 made voluntary. Um, the banks thus entered the crisis with no first line of defense. I'll just take you through this graph. Um, I don't know if you can see the years on the bottom. 
All right, it goes back to 1921. Um, the time that I'm talking about, 1971, uh, is the second part of that sharp fall. The first part is actually a change in the way the data is collected. Um, so if you want, you can just think about um, the first part of this graph before the first fall, and then this little ledge, and the second part. The second part is what was created by the change in 1971 called competition and credit control. You can also see, if, it, if you like that, what happened during the war. I'm constantly doing this, tracing it out on the screen. It doesn't make any sense. The dip is the war, and the peak is the um, position of the banks just after the war when they had a lot of surplus liquidity. But what is really important is that liquidity, liquid asset holdings of UK banks by 1981 was on the floor. And um, they entered the crisis with no defense at all against illiquidity, except the Bank of England. Similarly, banks were allowed to assess the risk of their own assets for the purposes of setting their Basel capital requirements under Basel II on the grounds that they knew the markets best and had the models by which to assess risk. And the Financial Services Authority uh, also relied on the market and competition as the main means by which banks were controlled. Alan Greenspan, um, uh, also confessed his reliance on markets and self-interest of the banks until the crisis forced him to rethink his position. One could ask what he means by self-interest because if the banks um, understood, and I'm sure they did, uh, that they were very likely to be bailed out if they went uh, over the edge, it was rational to go flat out as they did. So even self-interest doesn't quite work here. Now I just want to recap um, on the uh, items that I've brought to your attention, the aspects of economic theory, which I think are absolutely foundational to mainstream economics. Uh, so I'll leave that slide up for a second or two for you to have a look at. I really cannot stress enough the importance of these ideas to mainstream thinking. So central are they that any work not based on them, at least taking them as a reference point, does not count in their eyes as economic theory at all. Unspoken but very much at the background of this thinking is another assumption <coughs> that the choices of individuals can be aggregated to form markets without worrying about interaction between those individuals except through those markets. <coughs> There's no um, keeping up with the Joneses involved in the setting of individual preferences, for example. And finally, earlier I sneaked in uh, an assumption in the phrase, and everybody believes it, um, uh, another I central idea, central since about 1970, rational expectations. Rational expectations says that after a period of learning, perhaps when mistakes are made, um, expectations of, let us say, future prices will not differ systematically from the equilibrium the model predicts. Um, now, this, you could argue, assumes that the model is correct. But even if it isn't, if everybody acts as if it is correct, it will be self-fulfilling until some aspect of the economy not included in the model brings that self-fulfillment to a sticky end, as we saw. These ideas that I've rather quickly rehearsed with you are normally hidden behind a smokescreen of mathematics. Seeing them stated so baldly, I am reminded of Keynes's warning about formalistic exposition. 
uh, in which most economic theory is expressed. It is possible, under the cover of a careful formalism, to make statements which, if expressed in plain language, as I've just done, I hope, the mind would immediately repudiate. <clears throat> now, I hope I'm speaking to an audience which would agree with that sentiment when thinking back over the uh, basic assumptions that I've just outlined. What then accounts for the construction of a theory uh, that embodies those assumptions, and why is it accepted by so many? This is a, a central mystery, really, to me, since I don't accept this, this theory. It's very difficult for me to get into the mind of those who do. <clears throat> but this brings me to a, a fundamental difference uh, in the way that you can go about constructing a theory of the economic system. There are really two approaches, um, which I call idealist and realist, for lack of a better language. All theories abstract from reality. That's not the problem. But there are two ways to do it. The idealist starts from axioms, that is to say, things that are supposed to be self-evident, and deduce conclusions. And the realists start from an understanding of reality, uh, identify the salient features, and try to find causal connections. <clears throat> Modern mainstream economics is relentlessly idealist. It views the basis of rational choice theory um, in preferences and constraints as axiomatic, and the theory itself as foundational. The rhetorical force, I want you to notice, the rhetorical force of the word rational here is very powerful, for one immediately thinks that to relinquish this notion of rational choice is to um, model the economy on the basis of irrationality. But there are many rationalities, and the economist's version of rationality is very narrow. Also foundational is the concept of equilibrium. Um, there is a little passage from uh, Sir John Hicks, which I love to quote, because it strikes me as a statement of desperation. There is an equilibrium when all individuals are choosing the, qu the quantities to produce and consume which they prefer to a conception of equilibrium that is of this type we must hold fast. It sounds to me like a drowning sailor. Um, but uh, Sir John Hicks was only thinking of the necessity for equilibrium as an organizational principle and as a solution. For Robert Lucas, um, perhaps the most celebrated modern mainstream uh, theorist, equilibrium applies continuously. We are never out of equilibrium. He has described disequilibrium as arbitrary and unintelligible. For Lucas, a theory is an analog model economy built to mimic the features of the economy that the theorist wishes to analyze. For example, it exhibits cyclical fluctuations if the theory is tr um, trying to analyze business cycles. Lucas describes these models as artificial, abstract, patently unreal. There is nothing in principle wrong with such abstraction, provided a link is made to the real world. The builders of analog models, however, have not bothered much with the transition between models embodying perfect probabilistic knowledge of the future and complete markets to the imperfect and uncertain world in which we live. The closest they get to testing the model is to see whether it tracks other aspects of the economy um, than those it was initially designed to mimic. On the other hand, there is the realist approach, not to start with axioms, 
which, as you've seen, are not all that self-evident anyway in economics, um, and instead start with an appreciation of reality. Sorry, we've done that. Um, this is Keynes in a letter to Roy Harrod, to Roy Harrod, um, chiding him actually for his reliance on axiomatic models. Progress requires, as you say, a vigilant observation of the actual working of our system. Economics is a science of thinking in terms of models joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant to the contemporary world. The object of a model is to segregate the semi-permanent or relatively constant factors from those which are transitory or fluctuating so as to develop a logical way of thinking about the latter. Good economists are scarce because the gift for using vigilant observation to choose good models is a rare one. <clears throat> now, um, I've looked at the question of illiquidity and insolvency from this microeconomic perspective. Um, but when we turn to the question of the repercussions of the banking crisis, and the response to it, we need macroeconomics, the study of the economy as a whole. When mainstream economists set out to do macroeconomics, they insist on starting from the same rational choice theory. This is called giving macroeconomics micro foundations. Yes. Anything not micro founded is unacceptable to them. It was in order to pursue the aim of rigorous micro-foundations that the representative agent was adopted by mainstream economists. Everyone is the same. Everyone consumes, saves, and makes investment decisions. There are no differences between people from being, uh, attributable to being on one side of industry or the other. There is no influence uh, of one's position in the life cycle, and so on. Therefore, there can be no coordination failures, economists say, that is to say, that the thing all meshes together perfectly, no borrowing, for there's no one to borrow from, and no speculation uh, for the same reason. Each person can know by introspection exactly what the future will bring forth, because everyone is the same. <clears throat> in the real world, where individuals or groups act from their own interests and in partial ignorance of the larger picture, inferring the whole from knowledge of its parts risks committing the fallacy of composition. Avoidance of this fallacy through considering the economy as a whole constitutes the case for macroeconomics as a separate subject. It will not surprise you that mainstream economists deny the fallacy of composition and regard macroeconomics as having no right to a separate existence. This all follows from the wheeze of the representative agent. But the fallacy of composition is at the heart of the current debate about government expenditure cuts. The government says that paying down debts is just like paying off its credit card. It must cut its expenditure. The opposing argument looks at the repercussions on the rest of the economy. When income, incomes of government employees and revenues of their suppliers fall, um, those employees and suppliers will also cut back, the economy shrinks further, and tax revenue falls. The debt position could end up worse than before. Indeed, I did a study of 100 years of data to show that this is extremely likely. You and I can pay off our debts by cutting expenditure, but the government is just too big, uh, and uh, its actions have feedbacks to its own position. It's not actually in a position to say what will happen to its deficit. 
by its own, by its own actions. So there, there is one repercussion on a current debate directly related to two views of how to make macroeconomics. The government's rejoinder to this um, expectation that cutting their expenditure would uh, further damage the economy uh, was the opposite, that the private sector would fill the gap left by the cuts. This too has its origin in factors we've already seen. Market clearing so that there is always full employment and that implies a constant aggregate income. So if one sector in the economy goes down, the other sector will go up to compensate. Um, good theory says that if, that if one sector in the economy goes down, the others are likely to follow. At least what I think of as good theory says that. <clears throat> Returning to the question of the use of economics to understanding the financial crisis, it may shock you, it ought to shock you, to know that the financial sector does not appear in most mainstream economic models. <clears throat> there are at least two reasons for this. First, except for, the inter for international capital flows, one person's debt is another's asset. So in aggregate, domestic debts and assets cancel out and are therefore dropped. A second reason discouraging the inclusion of finance is the proposition that money, and by extension finance, is neutral in the long run when the quantity of money changes. Uh, sorry, sorry, when the quantity of money changes, all that happens is that prices change by the same proportion, leaving the real economy unaltered. This is an ancient idea it's been around for at least 350 years in print and probably more than that um, uh, verbally. Um, and it gives rise to an idea called the classical dichotomy. Um, this is the idea that you can divide the economy into a real sector and a financial sector and that they're separate and money only affects prices. It doesn't affect what goes on in the real sector it's merely a veil, slightly obscuring the real mechanisms uh, at work. Again, you can see this uh, most potently in the brief given to the European Central Bank, which has responsibility for inflation only, uh, uh, or the Bank of England's brief uh, to target inflation and only subject to that worry about employment and other factors um, in, in the macroeconomy. In other words, the central banks deal with money, money affects prices, give them uh, an inflation target uh, because um, money won't affect any other aspect of the economy. This is nonsense, but it is very powerful and it's embedded in our institutions. <clears throat> Good theory, by contrast, knows that the real and financial sectors are interrelated. I don't think there's any question about that. Anyone with common sense, it's so nice to talk to people whose common sense isn't corrupted by studying economics. Um, <laughs> anyone with common sense knows that to be the case. <clears throat> well, We've had enough bad theory. What about good theory? I'll give you only two examples. Um, a Dutch economist looked closely at um, those who actually did manage to predict the crisis. He was, um, most economists looked at the situation in the USA um, between, say, 2000 and 2006 well before things went bad in late 2007. He set up very stringent criteria. They had to explain why they came up with these predictions and so on. And he found that those who passed his criteria uh, 
um, shared certain features. They looked at the debt or credit flows in the financial sector. They distinguished between real and financial wealth. They knew what the links were between the real and the financial sectors. And they used flow of funds data. They were vigilantly observing the flow of funds data to come to their conclusions. These writers were, of course, not using mainstream economic theory. The crisis had sent a good many people scurrying back to look at the works of John Maynard Keynes, but even Keynes didn't look at the buildup of debt that is the counterpart of a long period of capital accumulation. Still less did he foresee the swelling of the financial sector that so unbalanced the advanced economies before the crash. In his time, the financial sector was tightly regulated and was not able to escape its role of servant to the real economy to become, as it did, the master of the real economy. <clears throat> well, this was a very interesting survey of those who were able to predict the crisis. But I want also to introduce to you what I've called here a general theory of crisis. Um, the crisis also sent people um, back to the works of a then obscure economist called Hyman Minsky. Um, <laughs> uh, this lovely little cartoon from the New Yorker shows them reading Minsky on every available uh, form of, of communication. He was another who embodied the principle of vigilant observation as he traced the development of financial capitalism throughout his career. He died in 1996 before things really got out of hand. Um, but his financial instability hypothesis um, is a very instructive hypothesis. He proposed that crises come out of stability itself. A period of stability leads to complacency and a search for higher returns, an undervaluation of risk, I should have added. Um, because stability leads to complacency, um, because things look so solid, people take more risk and the economy may move in stages from what he called hedge finance, where the cash flow uh, experienced by firms and households uh, was adequate to cover both interest payments and the amortization of borrowed capital, um, to speculative finance, in which um, the cash flow is only adequate to cover interest payments. And finally, there is the possibility of moving to what he called Ponzi finance. Ponzi was a, a, a New York con man, um, in which interest can only be covered by further borrowing. And when that happens, the debt, of course, becomes unsustainable. <clears throat> Minsky's vision really couldn't be farther from the complacency of what has been called the great moderation. This was a phrase popularized by Ben Bernanke in 2004. He didn't have very long to be proved wrong. Um, Bernanke, as you know, is now chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Um, it was believed at that time um, that fluctuations in GDP had become smaller, the whole economy had become more stable, we knew how to do inflation targeting, and in Gordon Brown's memorable phrase, we had abolished boom and bust. Minsky would say that in a period of great moderation, that was exactly the time to worry. <clears throat> well, these are just two examples 
of good theory producing useful analysis. Many economists are working in this realist vein, but they find it difficult to gain a hearing because bad theory has driven out good. Why were the warnings ignored? There are more or less benign reasons and some more sinister ones. Amongst the benign is that no one wanted to spoil the party. Think again of Gordon Brown, this time at the Mansion House in 2006, praising the banks for creating so much wealth. Or Alan Greenspan arguing that it was too difficult to prick a bubble, it was easier to clean up after it had burst. Especially, one might think, if you retire and leave the cleanup to other people. <coughs> um, but I hinted at the beginning, well, more than hinted, that there were less benign forces at work. And I think you should understand these. Mainstream economists are not tolerant of views that contradict their own. Since they began to gain power in the 1970s, they were not always the mainstream. They have done everything possible to defeat opposition. They now control the main academic journals, and it is nearly impossible to get a university appointment without publishing in these journals. The research assessment exercise, now the research excellence framework, assesses departments on the basis of publication in these journals. Work published elsewhere is assumed ipso facto to be second rate uh, and is ignored. Um, it, it, these are the nobodies that publish in these other journals the nobodies that saw the crisis coming. Direct confrontation uh, between mainstream economists and those who do not share their views uh, often exposes the challenger to ridicule uh, or savagery. One of the predictors of the crisis uh, who <laughs> delivered his, um, uh, his warnings at one of the meetings at Jackson Hole that the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City uh, runs annually, um, said that he felt like an early Christian who had wandered into a convention of half-starved lions. <clears throat> this ridicule and savagery is not new and is less important, actually, than the capacity to ignore. Keynes couldn't be ignored, but he seemed to attract animosity. Um, the general theory was subverted, even by his close associates, and Lionel Robbins mounted a campaign to counteract his influence, including bringing Friedrich Hayek to the LSE specifically for that purpose. The subversion went on until Keynes's theory became Keynesian theory, which is probably what you know as Keynes's theory, a quite different animal. And now there is new Keynesianism, which is one of the two strands of mainstream theory. Dear me. The original Keynes is unrecognizable to the majority of economists, let alone to the general public. The open question in Keynes's case it is what it is that caused the animosity. What was the objection? Was it to his change of method, introducing true uncertainty about the future and challenging the market clearing notion of equilibrium? Was it to elements of his theory, such as the ref refusal of the classical dichotomy, or to its political implications, which were very far reaching? He concluded that the economy was not self-correcting, that the free market was flawed and needed intervention to function well, that monetary policy, particularly interest rate policy, favored the financial sector rather than industry, and that the, the direction of capital accumulation uh, was in the hands of those with too short a time horizon and couldn't be left entirely in private hands. These are rather explosive conclusions. But it could have been any of these things. Any one of them was quite enough uh, to get some people um, ready to oppose him. 
And these considerations still apply today, still demarcate mainstream theory uh, and what is known in the trade as heterodoxy. Um, now, what is going on here? One of them is very obvious. Um, if you've invested a lot of energy in learning mainstream economic theory, uh, you'll want to protect your investment. And it has a career potential, which you also want to protect. We know from Thomas Kuhn that paradigms don't change until the old guard die off. More interesting, though, I think, is not the fate of the old guard, of which I am one, but, 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 but a heterodox. More interesting um, is why the young are attracted to this theory, this way of thinking. The mainstream, of course, control curricula and write the textbooks. Even when given a choice, students often choose mainstream thinking. <clears throat> Not all. There have been rebellions uh, in the news uh, over the last, say, 10 years, until the day before yesterday. Cambridge students have just founded a society for economic pluralism. Um, but mainstream economics does have a certain appeal. Its models are precise and give demonstrable conclusions, where an open approach, such as that of Keynes, requires knowledge of the economy and judgment over what to, to include. The younger you are, the less you trust your judgment because judgment depends on experience. So you gravitate toward the precise and the definite and the demonstrable conclusion. There was a survey of students in top US graduate schools. Uh, they, are, they were asked what makes a successful economist I'm not going to read this list to you, it's too depressing. But notice that like nice guys, the economy comes last. Um, <clears throat> this is a shocking finding. Um, and we certainly can't hope for much vigilant observation of the actual working of our system from the product of these graduate schools. The formal mathematical model has the additional appeal to both existing practitioners and new entrants of seeming to economists to be scientific. Economists have long aspired to scientific status while misunderstanding what science actually does. It's not just a matter of being able to state your conclusions in a formal mathematical framework. At a deeper level, the level of what Sheila Dow has called the mode of thought, there are also features which some find congenial. For example, mainstream economics derives from a dualistic mode of thought. Is it A or not A? And there can be nothing in the middle. Um, now, one can see that immediately in the classical dichotomy, for example. Um, but a dualistic mode of thought is particularly congenial to the young, the young like black and white. Gray areas require judgment, and uh, you have to learn to handle ambiguity. So the younger they are, the less comfortable they are with them, and by the time they've got some experience, they've forgotten how to use it. Um, another point about the dualistic mode of thought, of course, is that if you think like that and somebody disagrees with your theory, which you think is right, the other person has to be wrong. And this gives mainstream opposition to its alternatives its particularly hard edge. Finally, I have to er enter the area of ideology. It's, you know the problem, what you say is ideological, whereas what I say comes from pure conviction. Um, but there is no doubt that mainstream economics, particularly the new classical variant, which is what I've mostly been discussing in the section on bad theory, supports the proposition that free markets lead to an optimal solution. And as we know, um, free markets are regarded by some 
as desirable for their own sake. Someone once said that if mainstream economics did not exist, capitalism would insist that it be invented. When neoliberalism is in the saddle, espousing an economics which is so supportive of free markets uh, creates the opportunity to give policy advice, which makes economists feel important and valued. Um, sometimes to hold high-ranking policy posts, think of Larry Summers, for example, and to undertake the lucrative consultancies. I trust you've all seen the film Inside Job, and if you haven't, find it on DVD or something. It's an extraordinary document. Heterodox economists may give evidence to the odd select committee, but it rarely goes much further than this. The message is clear. If you want to speak to power, make sure you say what power wants to hear, even if the correspondence of your theory to the real world is, to put it mildly, problematic. <clears throat> In all these ways, bad theory has managed to drive out theory based on vigilant observation. What I have disobligingly called bad theory is the direct descendant of what Keynes called classical theory. And of this theory, he wrote, the characteristics of the special case assumed by the classical theory happen not to be those of the economic society in which we actually live, with the result that its teaching is misleading and disastrous if we attempt to apply it to the facts of experience. And so it is proved. Bad economic theory has been used to change the world in its own image, with the connivance of governments that relaxed regulations to enable those changes to take place. Business people, especially bankers, took full advantage of the opportunities thus offered. The results include a financial system which proved fatally fragile and austerity policies which are not only personally and socially disagreeable, but may also be self-defeating. Worst, in two countries so far, the crisis has undermined democracy. I would say it has been used to undermine democracy, but that is a subject for another time. It's rather, rather a full one. I conclude, therefore, that the uneven fight between good and bad economic theory is not a private squabble amongst academic economists, but a matter of profound public importance. Thank you. Thank you so much for your exposition, and I'm glad that you talked and at the end referred to the elephant in the room, which was ideology. Um, I think this is a key point and has to be addressed in order to uh, see a way forward. Um, I think if we start with a theory that does not admit of money existing, then how do we expect that theory to be able to be relevant to our lives. I'm referring to economic theory, of course. And the, so I wonder if you could comment on, on that. I think we have to go right back to the foundations of so-called economic theory in order to look at this. Um, the other th elephant in the room, I think, is business and management, which equally has got to be addressed because this is uh, quite a different um, uh, animals, should we say. So I think these points have to be addressed, but I thank you for your clear exposition of at least um, where we are and where economic theory isn't. Could, could I just um, ask for a little clarification of what you have in mind when you're talking about business and management? Could you expand on that a little bit, well, for my sake? Yes. It, <laughs> I saw industrial economics in the mid-70s at its high point and 
then I, I left myself academic economics and I was bemused to see that industrial economics from that point went on, went into terminal decline. Um, I mean, if you look at the works of, of Andrews, I think he's the prime example. Um, it's just Plant, Arnold Plant. Fine, and, and to, to look at similar, similar studies now is, uh, it's incomprehensible to see how we go from a, a position in the late 60s, mid 70s, where there was really a very good body of, I wouldn't say theory, I would say practice, concerning um, economic and commercial institutions to what we have today. So that's what I mean by management and business. Is I, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor. I'm uh, the general public. I'm not an academic. Or um, <clears throat> it's simply this: that um, in the early 2000s, three, four, five, I think many people in the general public that took an interest were aware of the coming problems. You mentioned bank liquidity and reserves. Uh, the subprimes were uh, given wide publicity, TV documentaries, um, levels of debt, uh, the sovereign debt, corporate debt, triple P and so on. So even those members of the public that had concerns saw, or we thought we saw what was coming. The element that you perhaps didn't mention, although you mentioned Mr. Brown, is the politics of it all. So even in recognizing these issues and perhaps listening to different advice, politicians perhaps uh, are stuck with a failed or, or, or failed uh, strategies. Is that the case? Uh, question, if I may, uh, Professor. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the question is very much one of uh, the fact that we see Western society these days spending beyond its means and whether any of the economic theories actually would stand water if we continue such behaviour. Okay. Shall I? Um, thank you all for your questions. Um, the first was really two questions, or two comments. Um, and, of course, ideology is really the center uh, of some of the problems, um, not all of them, I think. Um, I wonder if it would be possible to construct a, th construct a theory which has the same ideology but not quite the same ludicrous assumptions, um, uh, and how ideology filters in to heterodox economics. It's very clear that heterodox economics has a different take on um, its vision of the economy. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the ideology of the free market in connection with mainstream economic theory. Now, this is my chance to get in notice of another lecture, not by me, um, but also uh, to talk a little bit about what he said. Um, Steve Keane, who was one of the people who saw the crisis coming, is going to give a speech at the LSE, or a discussion at the LSE, on the 3rd of April. Um, and I recommend that you go into the website of, of just Google LSE events, and you will find Steve Keane um, and go along, you need a ticket for this event, but they tell you how to do it. Um, he argues that not only does um, uh, heterodoxy and um, people who believe that you know, capitalism has gone a little bit too far need to get rid of mainstream economics, but so also does the business community, because that theory has done such enormous damage um, that it's in the interests of business also to get rid of mainstream economic theory. And that's an interesting twist, I think. Um, 
<clears throat> you concentrated on the fact that the theory has no money, but there are so many absolutely insane assumptions that one can focus on um, that really probably the simplest thing to do is to scrap it all and start again. Uh, certainly that's what Steve Keen would advocate, and I think I do too. Um, and your point about business and management, of course, is one about vigilant observation. What uh, actually motivates those institutions? How do they work? How do they interact? Uh, when do they go off the rails? What um, incentives have encouraged them to go off the rails? These are all questions which these days <coughs> uh, industrial organization should be asking, but instead, as you know, it's become uh, a very abstract branch of theory as well. So I think the second part of your question reflects directly on <coughs> this matter of a realist outlook. And I, I call anything theory which systematizes ideas, and I think um, that you would agree with that. Um, uh, and industrial organization has become an idealist project, to use the language that I've, I've used heretofore. So I agree entirely. <coughs> um, your point about the general public being aware that there were difficulties and perhaps something nasty around the corner uh, in, in the early 2000s just makes my point that it's much nicer to talk uh, to people who are not infected with mainstream economics. They have much more going for them uh, and they are not blinded by um, the, the presumptions of mainstream economics. Uh, I, I bring up mainstream economics in order to let you know what is really going on there and how dangerous and insidious it actually is. Um, the politics, of course, is embodied in this question of, of not wanting to spoil the party, um, not knowing what else to do, encouraging the financial sector to grow, and, and because you don't understand the difference between real and financial wealth, um, congratulating the, the, the banks for creating all this wealth, which was just a lot of hot air, as it proved. Um, so, uh, I think that politicians are not immune um, from the deleterious effects of mainstream economics. They're, they're, they're advised by these people. They take in their ideas. Uh, and that is partly what limits their vision of what to do. I hope that's something of an answer to your question. Um, as for Western societies spending beyond uh, their means. This is a difficult one because whatever you produce will generate income uh, and you can spend that income. Um, and it's only by opening borders fully to the free flow of capital that the extent to which Western societies um, could spend beyond their means has really come to fruition. There are a lot of people who emphasize the global imbalances amongst countries that um, the freeing of capital markets has brought about. Um, again, I keep going back to Keynes rather boringly because it's something I know about, um, but it's very interesting actually to read his writings at the time of the setting up of Bretton Woods, where the idea of capital controls was considered perfectly normal and perfectly legitimate. Um, and his main concern was to make sure under the new system that surplus countries played at least as much of a role in rebalancing uh, an imbalance in the balance of payments as the deficit countries were required to do. And for this purpose, he wanted to um, impose penalties on the buildup 
of international reserves, uh, as well as um, penalties for those uh, who ran deficits. Um, he lost that battle about the surplus countries because America was a surplus country and they wouldn't hear of it. And so the symmetry that he proposed uh, was lost and now it is the case and has been, you know, since forever, that it's the deficit countries who have to do the adjusting. But there is a question, a general question here uh, about the globalization of capital flows um, which has permitted spending beyond one's means and, uh, and what to do about it, which is coming back into the news and into um, the sites of some of the international um, institutions, particularly the IMF. Well, sadly, as, as ever, Gresham, we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. Um, and I, I think we've covered so much, it's difficult to, to what to pick up. I uh, did take a few points I'd just like to share with you, if I, if I might, in closing. I mean, the first was uh, the terms there, heterodoxy, schism, uh, you know, the, all of this ideological conviction, the religious nature of theory, if I can go that far. Um, Kessler talks about closed systems of belief, uh, which were referenced, and he points out that, uh, one, they explain everything, and two, they use the system to invalidate others. Um, so he, he was focused, I think, particularly on psychologists who would say to you, you know, it's, uh, the reason you don't believe in the castration complex is that you have the castration complex. Um, and I certainly found this uh, most recently when I had an eminent economist who will remain nameless, but from a very famous institute explaining why none of the theories worked because the markets weren't perfect. Uh, and after we'd been through several markets to deal with oil and supermarkets, in exasperation I had to say, is there any market that you, you believe in uh, that you can learn from? I think the second thing is it's a lovely device to take the markets and use it against the economic theories itself. I, I, I loved that. Uh, and it is important to realize that there are actually a tremendous number of heterodox theories out there. Um, we could use this same presentation, I think, uh, with physicists and as they talk about string theory and its hold on, on mainstream physics. But the, the, the many other theories out there, I think, in economics are possibly the hardest to accept because you'd have to admit, you'd have to dust off Minsky, who was there all along. You'd have to dust off Keynes's Bancor, as the Chinese have done recently, and say, gosh, it was there all along. Or in the case of money, you'd be going back to chartalism or, or modern monetary theory, modern meaning 1900. Um, so there are uh, some interesting problems for economists, unlike many other fields, admitting that perhaps uh, what was written at the time of Aristophanes had some validity. Uh, and finally, um, I'd just like to close, because I, uh, as the leading Keynesian uh, scholar, uh, in the country, I think it's lovely. Um, and the one bit of Keynes that I picked out of the lecture, which I think does ground us in reality, was that lovely quote uh, that really our, our job is uh, to choose models which are relevant to the contemporary world. And I think that's what we failed to do. And I think uh, Victoria's challenge to all of us is to find those models, old, new, uh, undiscovered, uh, dust them off, and let's see how relevant they are to today's world. Would you all please join me in thanking uh, Professor Victoria Chick for a most stimulating lecture. Thank you. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.